What's up? Welcome back to Now Style. Dave here with a review of Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, 31st Marvel Cinematic Universe film, third Ant-Man film, Peyton Reed back in the director chair, all our usual suspects from Ant-Man back, Paul Rudd as Scott Lang, Evangeline Lilly, Michael Douglas, Michelle Pfeiffer, the gang's all here, Catherine Newton, a newcomer as the aged up Cassie Lang, and of course, the proper introduction of the Marvel Cinematic Universe's new big bad, King the Conqueror, played by the great Jonathan Majors. So, definitely a lot of anticipation going into Ant-Man 3. Less so for being an Ant-Man movie, and more so about being the movie debut of Kang, who of course we did meet in the finale of Loki Season 1 in the summer of 2021, a different version of Kang, and I think that's going to be a big part about this movie, is that uh, the multiverse and, and variants and all that's going to be a huge part of Marvel's storytelling. Uh, that seems quite obvious. But let's just get right into it. I think Ant-Man 3 is largely unsuccessful for really a key conceptual reason. Not that there's not things to enjoy about it. Jonathan Majors uh, is amazing. I love him. Even he cannot lift this movie up on his mighty biceps uh, as much as he might try. Ant-Man 3, unfortunately kind of has like two conflicting aims as a film. It's trying to be this hard sci-fi movie. It takes place completely in this quantum realm, you know, CGI fest that it is. It's trying to be this hard sci-fi story introducing the audience to the Marvel Cinematic Universe's new Thanos, the new big bad, who will be, you know, the, the villain in the upcoming Avengers movies in 2025 and 2026. It's trying to do that, all of that, while also being the third Ant-Man movie. And Ant-Man is just ill-conceived as a vehicle to accomplish these game, aims, and in the process, doesn't feel like an effective Ant-Man movie either. So it's really just a huge mixed bag to me. And, you know, I've been mixed to positive on the last run of Marvel with the Phase 4 uh, films that we've gotten, done a review on all of them, check them out, youtube.com slash nostalgia pod. thing, though, is like, you can't help but feel like there's a general sentiment that Marvel has been not hitting at quite the same rate lately, you know, with a few exceptions. We trust Sony and Spider-Man with Tom Holland. We expect Guardians 3 in May to be good, but largely, like, you know, things have been just okay. I, I love Shang-Chi so much, but largely, we've been on a, a rockier run. A big part of that, I think, is the uh, volume of MCU television shows that have definitely worn people down, and we now know that the show releases on Disney Plus will be slowing down. Uh, so maybe this can slowly correct itself. But just I think as as a as a idea as a prospect of how to introduce Kang and making it happen in the third Ant Man movie just was not a good idea to me. You know, the first two Ant Man movies, and really whenever we've met Ant Man. Paul Rudd plays Scott Lang really well. Those are heist movies. Those are comedies. Those are largely smaller stakes stuff. They've been setting this course to the quantum realm since the first Ant-Man movie. I'm not ignoring that. But what these movies attempt to be, I think, is just gone when you try and do quantum mania. You know, it's not about a heist. Really, anything about Scott Lang is kind of ignored over the course of this movie and they yada yada that relationship that make up for lost time aspect between Scott and Cassie. I think a big issue with that is like, we just kind of meet the family, you know, meet the Lang Van Dyne clan in the beginning. And before we know it, we're all in the quantum realm. Literally everyone is there. No one is on the outside. And we're just kind of in this kind of race against the clock survival story. And that's 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 what it is. And, you know, Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer have very little to do. Evangeline Lilly as the Wasp has exceedingly little to do. A kind of offensive how little she got to accomplish in this movie. And even Scott, I think, just is a bit kind of hapless in the movie. You know, and I like Catherine Newton. Uh, she's been in a lot of high profile stuff at this point. Her is Cassie Lang, eventually going to be the new Ant-Man pillar of new Avengers down the line. She'll fit right in. She'll be great. Um, she's still quite young. Great choice. But 
that doesn't serve this movie. Just like we know Jonathan Majors is awesome as awesome as Kang because he's a great actor. That doesn't really serve this movie though. You know, I think um, everything with the family, I just think doesn't really work. You know, big issue is like Pfeiffer, like the whole aspect of this movie. It's just because uh, Pfeiffer hasn't told anyone about her 30 years spent in the quantum realm with Kang. She just withholds information. And then once they get all thrown in there and she's, you know, kind of being the uh, survivalist guide for everyone to keep everyone alive, she still won't tell them anything. It is a bit frustrating. You know, I think um, being in the quantum realm, a lot of Star Wars influence, I think, for sure, in terms of the science fiction stuff. I don't necessarily would say that the the, the CGI looks bad, but there is a ton of it. And you don't really spend any time dwelling on anything, right? Like Kang's big city. Don't really do anything in it, except spend time in one room. The rebel slash survivor people, where you meet William Jackson Harper's character and David Dasmashian's uh, ooze guy. They're like so thinly drawn because we barely spent any time with them that it's fine. But I just don't think there's like enough heft behind the quantum realm. I just didn't feel... I don't know. I just I wasn't super engaged by it. It really has nothing to do with the quality of the effects either. I think it's just like conceptually, we're not spending any time coloring in the quantum realm, which is supposed to be this entire like new dimension that exists under or around everything, however you want to explain it. But it just doesn't feel, I think, interesting or even that different from say like spending time in. I don't know, the cosmic space in the Guardians movies, for example, or Eternals, you know, it just, I don't know, it just fell, fell a little off to me. I think the most interesting potential the Quantum Realm could have given us was towards the end, there where Scott has been given this, you know, Faustian bargain, in a sense, from Kang. You have to help me, the bad guy, get me the thing I want so that you can save your family. Classic storytelling trope, but it's classic for a reason because it's really effective and dramatic that did, did it make sense what they were really getting the, the you know getting the, the getting kang's orb going in no but it's fine you can yada yada that i wanted that dramatic heft to i think be richer but that and it had a potential to do it right you had that, like the probability field aspect of the quantum realm interesting premise and in a brief moment, it was almost the most ant man of all things, you know, watching all the Scots work together. But I just think, like, tonally, the film kind of shies away from, like, anything landing, right? You have all these moments where, like, the Ant-Man humor has to kick in to shower you in any le le levity when there perhaps was going to be any semblance of negativity or drama. <laughs> and... I don't know, like, by the end there, like, Kang gets sucked into the orb and perhaps killed this variant of Kang somehow. I, I would have loved if there was, like, any stakes to anything that happened to the family. Towards the end there, I thought, oh, we're Douglas and Fife are going to get stranded. Are we going to lose some of the older characters? No. Well, everyone makes it out with really nothing of consequence has happened. To some people, like, that's okay. This was kind of like a weird bottle episode for the Ant Man story, and in the process, gave us Kang uh, fully formed. I guess that can be a takeaway. I just don't think it's like dramatically interesting as a film, and it's not that I expect Marvel to be like the most deep, engaging thing ever. But coming off Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, you know, there are richer themes to be had in these movies if you're interested in doing them. And again, Ant-Man, lower stakes, comedy. It doesn't need to be Black Panther in terms of weight, but at least let some things land. You know, even like MODOK, who I think was a, was a fun surprise, even funner surprise that it was a combination with a Yellow Jacket Darren from Ant-Man 1, Corey Stoll coming back. When MODOK dies, they, they, they joke about it. They, they laugh about it. You know, they, they, they can't let anything actually like stick for even a second without making some jokes you know uh, don't be a don't be a dick is like the takeaway of all that it's like okay fine but i don't know i, I just thought a lot of this was like super ill-conceived that being said good performers as usual right nice to see bill murray show up and 
be Bill Murray for a split second, alluding to uh, him and Pfeiffer having sex in the quantum realm. That was funny. Michael Douglas's reactions, those were funny. Uh, I'm here for that. Would I have loved Michael Pena to somehow be in an Ant-Man movie again? Yes, Luis is hilarious in the first two movies, but no, like, that's not what this movie is interested in. That being said, we have to talk about Kane the Conqueror. We have to talk about Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors has begun his amazing 2023. Of course, he'll be the villain in Creed 3 very soon, and also is the star of the Searchlight film Magazine Dreams, which his performance got a lot of uh, love for, and I'm sure we'll be talking about come award season next year. But it, Majors can only do, so I think, so much with like this movie that doesn't actually give him a whole lot to do. He just kind of gets to stew and steam and be bad, but his powers and his motivations are largely undercooked. Like This is a, a very conqueror variant of Kang, fine. But like what Kang does and how he does things, I don't think is very well defined. And do, certainly what he does do in terms of like his powers and controlling people and like shooting stuff out of his suit, none of it really is differentiated beyond anything that anyone else has done in the history of the Marvel films. So I would like to see more uh, of Kang in su- subsequent films to make his, you know, Avengers Kang Dynasty villain villainy really land. And I'm sure we will be getting that. Uh, especially in Loki season two, as we know, for the post grad scene. But Majors is able to chew on scenery because he's just like, that strong and talented of a dramatic actor. They finally let him like beat up Scott at the end. It's kind of ludicrous that Scott's able to like beat him up back in his like normal state. Uh, but that's Marvel for you. You know, <laughs> they rip up the suit a little bit so you can see how absolutely yoked Jonathan Majors as a person is in terms of how jacked he is. But they largely make him cover up, which I think honestly is is a bit of a mistake, given how shredded the man is. But that's not how Kang is usually portrayed, so I get it. But um, yeah, I just I don't know. Like it's not even at the end there too. Like the De- Deus Ex Mahina being like the return of the ants, and Michael Douglas says literal like you know animal ants. It's cool, but I don't know. I. I I honestly found like a movie like Eternals a bit more interesting. Not that it's more successful, I don't think it is, but that at least I think had like more interesting goals as as a Marvel movie. Whereas this movie so clearly had only one goal in mind, which is present the audience with Kang. Oh, and by the way, here's Catherine Newton as Cassie for the future. Other than that, it doesn't really do anything for continuing the Ant Man story, nor does it take anyone off the Ant-Man board and close any loops either. Everyone's still in play. So it's just kind of a mixed like interstitial to me. Uh, the next Marvel movie will be The Marvels, which has been delayed out of July into uh, November. Sorry, that'll be the, the, the last one of the year. Guardians 3 comes out in May. The Marvels has been pushed back. I think it's smart to give more time to these movies. We don't need to release three movies between February and July. Nice choice. Guardians 3 I have a lot of faith in, but that's also kind of a product of old Marvel, right? This is the end of things. James Gunn moving to DC. Uh, all these Guardians characters seemingly happy to hang up their capes. I'm sure we'll see some of them soon again. But, like, the Guardians films have run their course. The Marvels is a huge question mark due to the mixed success, but it kindly of the first movie. Of course, the introduction of Kamala Khan from the Miss Marvel TV series should liven things up. But, I don't know, like... The through line, storytelling wise, is like we're still at the very beginning of this, right? And like starting off with Kang, but like the whole like there's another Kang out there. The variants, you kill one, does that make any difference at all? Like I think they have a lot of storytelling work left to be done in terms of communicating like incursions and timelines fracturing and how that all matters, like. They have to do a lot of work in the lead up to Secret Wars to, I think, make that make sense to the average audience member. Because I don't know about you, but like, if I watch Jonathan Majors die another three, four, five times in the next few years, different versions of Kang Shore, but like, I don't know how effective that's going to last. We certainly watched Thanos die uh, two different times in the Avengers films. I don't know. I have a lot to wait and see. I don't think they totally nailed setting up Kang yet, even with that post-grad scene showing you all the other versions of Kang, including Immortus and 
Ramatut and all those dudes, you know, they got more work to do. And we'll see um, how they achieve that in the movies, because I just don't think you can expect audience members to like know and understand two seasons of Loki and use that as their grounding principle. They should want to watch Loki. It was the best MCU series for sure, but you need to do the work in the movies too. And even watching Loki season one, I don't think makes a huge difference with Ant-Man. And that's just a question of execution and intent and concept as I've gotten into. So more to come on MCU, more to come on this new storytelling front. I am happy to see that Marvel is going to be slowing their role with the TV series and giving things more time to breathe, giving VFX more time to be done. All that sounds great. We don't need six show, four shows and four movies a year, three shows and four movies a year, as we got the last two years. We don't need all that. They're figuring that out, and this is largely driven uh, by costs, but they're figuring it out one way or another. So let's hope creatively that the movies can start to pick it up, because I think Ant-Man is a three is a kind of a rough starting point in the film front for this new story, this phase five plan. So we'll see. But let me leave a comment below. How'd you feel about Ant-Man 3? How'd you feel about the introduction of Kang to the movies? Are you excited about seeing more Kang? Which are you most looking forward to next? Guardians 3, Marvels? How are you feeling about Phase 5? And just in general, for more movie reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.